Okay, I think we can start it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. So it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome and uh, also to introduce uh, Professor Jiang Hai Zhang um, for the actually a very interesting talk uh, for uh, today's colloquium. Uh, let me introduce a little bit uh, the, the biography of the Professor uh, Jiang. Jiang actually is a graduate from this institute uh, of this department in 1971 and 1978, he got a PhD in UC Berkeley. So I uh, think uh, including two years uh, in military service and then five years uh, in the UC uh, Berkeley. And then after two years postdoc uh, in uh, IBM, and then he got the, the faculty position in uh, 1980 uh, in uh, the UC. Uh, no, the U UI, yeah, the University of the Indo. And he actually is a, a long-term expert focused on the single cell radiation and the photo emission and also the, the nanoscale the, uh, ultra thin beam. And he got, uh, got a lot of prize. I only like to uh, emphasize the two, mention the two uh, very important uh, prize. In 1995, he got the prize of the Davidson Gamma Prize uh, from the APS, it's American Digital Society, 1995. And 1996, this is actually this is a great honor also uh, to get the academic the academic senior car uh, in Taiwan. Uh, so I think that I will stop here. So I think that you can spend maybe more time to introduce your uh, research and also the, the very interesting uh, career. Okay, let's welcome uh, Professor Jeff. Much. Uh, I guess you got a year wrong, not 1995, this is 2015, <laughs> <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> but, uh, but you got the first part of right, I graduated from physics department in uh, 1971, and so I'm very, very old, and uh, I did my two year military service, so I'm very proud of that. Anyway, uh, today uh, this is a great, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and also for the occasion, uh, it's nice to see all the young people here. And it will make you feel so jealous because I really want to be young again. So time goes on only one direction. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about novel electronic effects in ultrasound films. Uh, this title was uh, uh, Minson's uh, approval, saying that this got to be really as simple as possible. Okay, so I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, I will talk about how we create a tiny uniform metal films. Okay, to do a, a very precise uh, experiment, you want to know your film thickness uh, with atomic layer resolution. So we like to create a single layer, two layer, three layer, four layer, without any variation. So that's the important point of this thing. Once we make those uniform films, then uh, we apply angle to resolve the photon emission spectroscopy or alphas to measure the photon uh, well states, uh, which we can see directly with this method. And then uh, we discover this 1D shell effects. So basically, as we <coughs> increase the film's thickness one atomic layer at a time, we follow the physical property variations. You see periodic property variations as a function of film thickness. And the uh, analogy is that uh, we are dealing with the particle in the box where the electrons are confined in the film. So it's like a particle in the box. And just like in atoms, where the electrons are confined in atoms, so in the atom, you have a 3D situation. In the same films, we have one dimensional situation. But even in this one dimensional case, we have periodic table effects in the film. So it's just like atoms. Okay? You go from one atom to the next, you add electrons in the films. You make it thick, thicker, you get more electrons in the film shell. The same way. So I'll demonstrate that, and then you lead to variations of periodic oscillation in thermal stability and work function, the electron form coupling, and I'll mention briefly superconducting transition temperature because that's related to the, uh, to the strength of the, of the coupling between electrons and phonons. Anyway, there's lots of questions. Uh, if you have understand that we have any urgent questions to ask. And then to, towards the later part of the talk, by the time, depending on how slowly I go, 
I'll talk about cobalt insulator films because right now cobalt insulator is uh, kind of now kind of hot. And in fact, the cobalt insulator is already not so hot. Now people are talking about uh, give us semi metals, uh, wild fermions, and uh, type, type 1, type 2, and uh, all kinds of uh, things. So, so they are all kind of connected with has something to do with the topology, and topology. And maybe I have time, I'll talk about other things. And finally, I'll conclude with some comments on uh, why these things are possibly useful in the future in terms of devices. So the devices are made of thin films. And so we hope that we bring basic research to the realm of uh, practicality. So uh, let me mention that uh, we have been doing this for a very long time. Lots of people involved here, maybe students, postdocs, and then uh, collaborators. And, uh, so you do not find your name here, just let me know. I might have forgotten you, you are one of the collaborators. <laughs> Sometimes they can keep track. And uh, we mainly use two techniques. One is photo emission for others. And that is done with the SRC synchro repeat standard. And that was open, open store in 1986 and closed in 2014. And after it closed, we moved to ALS lens light source to Berkeley. And then we also perform X ray diffraction so you can measure the atomic structure. And that's done at the APS lens photo source. Argon electric laboratory. So here is just some uh, equipment. And the Professor Xu Jiang Tang is now the chief scientist. So he was a uh, very important uh, group member for some years. And that was uh, a student of a former group member. We have, uh, I have already got through many generations of students and uh, grand students. <laughs> so uh, uh, just uh, to tell you what the office is about, not everybody is an expert in similar conversation. And in fact, I, going around, I always get these people sometimes feel complaining. You guys spend a lot of money building up simultrons. You know, what the hell do you do with them? <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to defend that because I'm, you know, I don't build simultrons. I use it, so I'm very happy. And here is an example. This is SRC, simultron radio center in Wisconsin. It's a lot of these one jet ring. As I mentioned, it's closed for in 2014. And so the structure is very simple. You have the electron gun, and uh, you X-ray the electron gun using microtron to, uh, to 100 MeV, and then you inject into a storage ring. Uh, the ring basically is a vacuum tube. It's a stainless steel pipe. The electron goes in there, it vacuums, it goes around, and uh, the energy goes up to 1 MeV. And, uh, now to form a closed orbit, like a circle, circular orbit, magnetic field to bend the electron beam around. And during that bending, you, as you learn from Jackson's DNA book, or this to read Jackson's book, that's good. I use that book. And I love it because the problem is so hard. <laughs> and he's laughing, so he solved all the problems. Actually, I did all the problems myself. <laughs> <laughs> so here you're looking at a legend. Anyway, uh, anyway, it tells you when the uh, electron goes through acceleration, which is centrifugal acceleration in this case, it will emit radiation. And when the energy is very high, the emission by relativistic transformation is kind of highly focused in the forward direction. So these beams come out, and we also use magnetic structures for angulators. So if the beam gets, the electron beam gets bent multiple times, so it adds more intensity. And so around the ring, we have a of beam lines where the light uh, comes out and you put an end station here to do your measurements. So we are just one of those guys at the end station doing experiments. This big machine is just a light source. And the light comes out in the infrared, VUV, we mostly use VUV for photo emission, and always for X-ray where you can do diffraction. Now this low energy ring is mostly just uh, low energy photon. And so this was built in 19... Uh, 86, that's how it looks like. It starts with a warehouse, and kind of ring is laid out. And then later, just before it's closed, it's kind of fully crowded with a lot of stuff all over the place. It's very hard to walk around. And that's all the beam lines from the ground. And since that was closed in uh, a couple of years ago, and I fought very hard for three years, but I was not able to save the place. So we moved to ALS, better place, see? Berkeley. This is San Francisco, you can see the Bay Bridge. And this is the original 88 inch 
cyclotron, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence uh, got his you know, Nobel Prize in the one of his machines. That's the original dome. But then they add the rings around it. And so a bigger building, they build the uh, LS, okay, that's 1.9 jet ring is for higher energy. So <coughs> it was higher. And so we're very happy there. Uh, so you get to see the beautiful bay area. Now the only downside is students then uh, tend to spend all time outside. <laughs> And uh, also, uh, I should mention that uh, to use X hard X-rays, so we need a higher energy ring. So we go to advanced photon source to the Argonne National Laboratory, 7 GB ring, with much bigger peaks, okay? And uh, we spent uh, years to build a UNICAP facility as we perform our survey X-ray detection work. Uh, it's still there, and I'll show you the equipment in just a uh, bit later. And, uh, now, of course, we also use a, I use a little bit the synchrotron here in Taiwan. And there are two storage rings here. One is the original ring, KLS, 1.5 jet. And the TPS, the new ring, the three jet ring, which is just how it's working this year. And uh, now there's no bay, uh, so the view is uh, still pretty good, though. You see all the trees there. And then finally, I should mention, although I'm not going to talk about the work we've done here, but we also use many other facilities, including the free electron laser facility called the LINAS uh, LCLS, okay, and known as the LINAC coherent light source, known as the SLAC standard. So that's the LINAC coming in here, and then uh, you see the measurements down, down here. <coughs> and then it uh, looks like a control room of the space shuttle as well. So you can't really go in there, it's a very big machine. <coughs> okay, so uh, getting to science, okay, we use, as I mentioned, we use harpers to measure the diatonic structure. Uh, here's how we do it. Okay, here's a storage ring. Light comes out and goes on the sample, and we excite electrons come out. So this is typically uh, in the energy of the photon is in the range of from say a few electron volts to a few tens of electron volts. And the energy is high enough to overcome the work function so the electrons come out. <coughs> and we just measure the angular distribution and the energy distribution and so from which we back out the electronic space or the electronic structure of the system when it's in the original ground state. We back it out by energy conservation and momentum conservation. We can back out wherever it comes from. Now we are dealing with thin films. The case is very simple. So let's say that, uh, let's assume that we look at the uh, normal emission, that is the electron to come out of the perpendicular film. And we can imagine that along the perpendicular direction, this is the top surface and bottom surface, is the electrons are confined. It's a, they come back and forth from the standing wave. Okay? So we see these standing wave patterns. Okay? Angle one from well state, angle two, angle three. So you can actually see the, uh, the film. And uh, so you, you just measure photon emission. You can see uh, these discrete states that come out. And you subtract the energy of photon, you back it out, and you get the original energy states in the ground state. Right. It's all clear. How we do it? Don't bother, uh, bother you with the details. But anyway, so along the perpendicular direction, you get these quantized states. Okay. But uh, of course, you can also measure the uh, dispersion relationship in the plane. Change the angle, and you change the angle typically though is like a free electron like dispersion, so you get what kind of parabolic dispersion relation. You can see that. And so here is an actual real example we call these subbands, okay? So 50 smaller layers, ML smaller layers, 50 smaller layers of silver, uh, silica one on one, and then uh, so instead of just one big blob, as you would for a single crystal silver, you see these discrete states just like a picture. And then, in fact, you should count it. You see 550 of them. You got 50 layers, you got 50 bands. You can count them. That's how we know the signal, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there's a little band gap here. There's a surface state. There's some complication we can <coughs> talk about. But anyway, there's this parabolic dispersion. Uh, 50 of those guys, so we need to be like that. And, uh, well, I lied a little bit. The things are much more complex. We, you can actually take more detail to study of that thing by doing a, a uh, mapping along the x and y direction. So 
before I just show one cup, there's one parameter. So you can see the multiple parameters, one cup. So it also looks a cup along different, different direction. So basically, it's going to perform noidal surfing for each atomic layer to do a perform a noidal energy surfing. And, uh, and, uh, and you can see these things are kind of pretty interesting. There's some kind of modulation here. That has something to do with the crystal structure. You also see these kind of kinks. Those kinks are actually real. They are not fake. They are totally real. Those have something to do with the substrate the atomic structure. The substrate is silicon. The silicon has band edges and all that stuff. So when these bands cross the band edges, they actually some interference. And then they can give rise to some detailed shapes. Those shapes carry very important information. But I'm not going to bother you with those details. And you look at the Fermi surface, the top surface, you can see not only these got these parabolas coming through to some circles, you also got these guys, those coming from uh, uh, diffraction effects. So, so the fact is uh, we are not dealing with the ideal uh, vacuum slab. Instead, we have uh, atomic structures as well. The substrate has atomic structures. And uh, <coughs> it's got a, you know, like diffraction gradient. So the interface, the electron bump, bumping back and forth and give rise to diffraction. And that diffraction gives rise to these additional rings. And in fact, I should impress upon you that all these can be computed, they come out to be exactly right. You know the best structure is computed. OK, so, so I talked about uh, this uh, for noise or band. So this is silver film again on silicon 101. So I talked about it. So this is 10 layer, 50 layer, 90 layer, 150 layers. You see the evolution. Okay, 10 layer, you got to see this guy here, the parabolic band with some kind of uh, interesting thing that has something to do with the substrate band edge, silicon band edge. You go to 50 layers, the substrate effect becomes less, and you got these 50 bands there, I mentioned there. So you look deeper, though, so this corresponds to that one. So you look deeper, you got this whole, whole bunch of stuff here. Those correspond to D bands. So you can see the SD band, the free edge on light, you get D bands deeper. And eventually, when you get it thick enough, all gets smeared out and they fall crystal. So the 150 layers is the same as a single crystal. And you cannot see the discreteness of the system anymore. So let me show you the uh, band structure of uh, silver. So remember, this, uh, around the dome center, you got this, this uh, SP band with the free electron light. And you got D bands. And if you look at the calculate band structure formation time, sure enough, you got SP band, you got the D band. It's all clear. So we have all taken so it's just this right? So anybody who is not taking so it's even you not want to admit. <laughs> it's all right. Okay, uh, just on the side note, that is that uh, I mentioned the uh, the film on a substrate, uh, the interface is really not uh, really flat sense that you do have atoms. So film are made of atoms. The surface is also made of atoms. And to prove that this atomic effect is important, there's one trick we can play. That is to start with the substrate with cup at an angle. So you just imagine that this atomic layer is atomic layers of the United substrate you can imagine. So instead of making this a perfect plane, we cut it at an angle. Then uh, you will have step surface. So, so every now and then you will have a step missing. Reprod, so you got step surface uh, of the substrate. This, is, this actually has happened with silicon 557 uh, coated with gold, so you got this step surface. And then when you deposit film, you got film which has got the same thickness, except you also got the steps. And so you got a diffraction gradient here, you got a diffraction gradient here. And when you do these types of upper measurements, you can actually see uh, uh, the, uh, these sub bands or these parabolic bands are no longer centered center. So the angle is not zero degree anymore, but it's offset. So that proves directly that this the substrate effect is important here. So in order to do it, not a really flat surface. So if this is a flat surface, this flat surface, these guys should all be at zero. They do not. And possibly we can play many different games. Okay, anyway, uh, let me move on. We talk about the periodic property variations, which is the main subject matter I want to bring up. Uh, based on theory, uh, 
And I've already mentioned this analogy between uh, atoms in the periodic table. So when you look at the periodic table, you go from hydrogen atom and you keep on adding electrons, it goes through the periodic table. As you add electrons to the atoms, it goes through different atomic shells, so different shells get filled. And so the periodic table of the atoms has periodic relations in property. So go from left to right, the property changes periodically. And same film has exactly the same situation. That is, as the film thickness increases, you get more electrons in the field of shells. And so the, uh, theoretically, you can, uh, you can show that in general there will be periodic relations. So these are the periodic relations. So any physical property is a function of atomic number, the number of atomic layers will have these relations. So the problem is that there's a beating effect. That is, even so, this should be in general Damped oscillation, so it should be damped because when the film thickness gets very, very large, you should approach the bulk limit. There should be no oscillations. Uh, but when it's thin, there will be larger oscillations, so it should be damped. However, the signal is not a continuous variable because when you have 10 layers, you cannot have 10.1, 10.2. So it's only 10 and 11. So there's a natural periodicity associated with atomic layer thickness. And so you have two periods into one's atomic layer thickness, and the other one is the, the oscillations associated with the electron structure. And two periods are not necessarily commensurate, and in general they are not. And you get this beating effect, so generally speaking, you get this beating pattern. And you can measure that directly in, uh, in some cases in the experiment. But the important thing, though, you, is that physical properties will, in fact, oscillate as a function of thickness, which I'm going to try to demonstrate in the next. So now let me uh, uh, show you, we can actually make these films quite well. Uh, so here we have uh, silver on I and one zero zero, 38 atomic layers, and uh, in normal emission, we see this discrete cone of states, as I mentioned before. Okay, and then there are 39 layers, and we have layer, and you can see this uh, cone of states, that they are at different energy positions, because when you change the cone of thickness, the energy shift. And uh, in the middle, we have a 38.5. You basically take 38 more in your field, you add half the way apart. Now, of course, I mean, the, as the atom is an atom, you cannot divide into, into halves. So what happens when you half the sample is actually has a thickness 38, and the other half of the sample is 39. And so in the middle, you got a mixture. You got 30, 38 plus 39, 50, 50. And so it's in both sets of peaks. So this is actually very important to demonstrate that. At 39 layers, we have no 39. Okay, there's no peak. And then we can also show there's no 37. So when we say the 38 is exactly 38. Yeah. So we, we were the first one in the world to demonstrate this possible. And most people make same films when you say 38. You could have 30 all the way to 50 kind of raw distribution. But we can make this one. And I'll tell you how to make it. And for many years, we were the only one in the world until the sticker came out and everybody else. So it's good to be uh, the best in the world for a while. So what's the trick? The trick is just uh, in MBE, we, everybody heard the MBE molecular beam mass test. You are trying to grow the same films. And the idea is to uh, deposit atoms on the surface. And then the substrate should be at a certain temperature. And the temperature should be high enough that the atoms will have enough thermal energy Around. And so the atoms will be able to find the best places for them to be. Okay, so they will form a smooth film. But when the temperature is high, there's also entropy effect. And so the tends to make the thing not so smooth. So, so the high temperature is important for the atom to move around. But it also, at the same, point, at the same time, it actually makes the film not so smooth. So you end up with a film. The film is pretty good, but never perfect. Okay, so it's an MBE. So we tried that for many years. And then we uh, thought the other way, let's do a low temperature deposition. And so when you deposit atoms on the surface, the atoms will stay frozen. <laughs> they become frozen into an amorphous structure. It's not supported. But then you hold it, you raise the temperature near the system. And then the system will crystal crystallizes starting from the substrate. That's what we perform the, the single crystal. And if you have just the right amount, it becomes a perfect film. It's a very simple trick. Genome won't tell people, so they, they are 
everybody or like we did, we keep on raising temperature because of the higher temperature better. We tried for many years, we never succeeded because it was the other way. So anyway, that's a trick that we can make the film. Now how how is it how low? How low? Uh, technically uh, nitric temperature is good enough. Yeah, you don't need to see any temperature. Okay, go to slide on. So for a while for it. Now, Anyway, uh, let me show you the uh, making of these atomically, atomically uniform films, one atomic layer at a time. <laughs> and I was very fortunate to have the best postdoc and best students in the world at that time. And so I just said, do it. And they are uh, you know, very patient with it, with it one layer at a time. So they start from one layer, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And keep on building up. Okay. Of course, I was very nice to my students. Also. <laughs> I kind of tell them that if you do this thing, you'll become very famous. Anyway, so these are the quantum well states. So the single layer, one layer, you can see there's a quantum well state, A equal to one quantum well state. And we have maybe two layers, the quantum well state is actually over here, it's not the same anymore. And then three, four, so the quantum well state goes through this uh, movement. And goes to a Fermi level, you can see. It. <coughs> and then, uh, then, then quantum number two, quantum well number two comes up and moves three and four. Okay. So, so forth. And then the important though is, for example, the five layers, the pit is here, six layers here. At five, we see no pit at six. And we see no pit at four. So five and five, there's no six and no four. So every one is exact. So we plot these uh, positions, the energy positions of the quantum well states for the A1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that's a function of thickness. So you can see they move up, up in energy and go through a Fermi level and the Fermi level cut off. And then every now and then one of them will cut, cut through a Fermi level and it disappears. Okay. And then these are theoretical curves, so they actually fall right on the theory as well. And uh, so here is the argument. That is, you know, we have these quantum well states, and when it uh, goes to a, a, uh, a point where the cusp of Fermi level goes from occupied to unoccupied, so the electronic structure goes some kind of uh, a trauma or some kind of change. It's like a thing up there, the uh, electronic shell. And so at that point, we, we believe something will change. And in fact, we do a calculation, for example, the work function, then a uh, theory predicts at those crossing points what function is show, show a downward cusp, a sharp dip. And experimentally, indeed, the work function, measure work function, is <coughs> cusp, right? There's a cusp, right? There's a cusp, right? There. So not too bad, and it works out pretty well. So that's the first sign of the periodic relation of physical properties with the sharp dip model. And again, that's one in charge effect. We see the periodic oscillations. And then uh, later, of course, we have better examples to show this. Now another uh, very important effect is the thermal stability. And while we were doing experiments, as the postdoc was very patient and we were making these films, occasionally he has a hard time making a specific thickness because that's just so, so, so tough, it's very hard to make. It's just not, just a new little bit over the film and disappears, you don't have the film anymore. And so we then realized there's a very large variation in thermal stability. Some films are very stable, others are not so stable. We actually discovered this easily, we didn't realize what's going to be a big effect. So we uh, make a uniform film with raised temperature, and then the film at some point will bifurcate into a n plus one and n minus one. Atoms conserve, because we of course have the right number of atoms. But the film then becomes uh, you know, rough, and you heat up more, then it becomes rougher. That this formation we can actually check very carefully, but very easily. And as I was shown here is actually the measure of stability for the different film thicknesses. So here's the film thickness, and that's the maximum temperature where the film is stable. And you can see one layer is very is stable up to 900K, and two layers are uh, also very stable, but three and four are very unstable. Five is so stable that we can never destroy it. Uh, so that's 900K, that's the maximum temperature we could assemble two at that time, so 